So uh, let's define the goals of the therapy. So first of all, it's uh, symptom control. Uh, the second goal is induction of remission. And uh, the third goal is maintenance of remission. And finally, it's prevention of flare-ups, which is also part of maintenance of remission. So uh, you can utilize those principles to any type of chronic illnesses, including malignancies. You can utilize to any autoimmune disease. So it's a basic, basic principles. So uh, uh, before we move forward, uh, so I want to make a couple of general statements. So uh, complete eradication of microorganisms or viruses uh, which cause chronic Ill infection uh, almost impossible. And so if you have patients saying, well, I want to eradicate this and this and that, so the first thing which I tell them, it's impossible, so you have to live with that. And so initially patients are getting shocked because they don't understand so why it's happening. But then you need to give them some examples. So for example, a simple example is uh, varicella zoster, right? So all human beings carry the virus for the, basically their whole life. Uh, and so the virus initially manifests in the form of chicken pox, right? then the virus goes in dormant state, and then at a certain age it can get reactivated and form shingles. So then, you know, the virus goes back in dormant state again. And so people can have shingles five, six, ten times during their lifespan. Why? Well, because the virus is still in the system. And this, it's just an example. The same is true for the viruses, and the same is true for majority of uh, microorganisms and bacteria. So in general, in general, uh, it's a very and professional tell patients that I'm going to cure from the infection, it's not going to happen. So the realistic goal is to induce dormant state when patients will be absolutely healthy and symptom free and don't think about, you know, that they have an infection. So if you ask me what's the examples, known examples of bacterial infection, well, a typical example is tuberculosis. So patients with active TB, they're treated for a year and a half or two years with antibiotics, and then what? Well, then TB goes in dormant state, all these patients carry uh, mycobacteria tuberculosis in their lungs. But these are dormant microorganisms. They don't bother patients, they don't bother people, they don't cause any clinical symptoms. So uh, it's a dormant state. So again, uh, I want to be very clear that we're not talking about eradication of these microorganisms, it's impossible. In ma sometimes it is, but in majority of the cases, it is impossible. So uh, how do we start our process? So basically we do obviously, fishing expedition, we define what's the uh, most likely cause. Uh, we obtain quantitative titers of corresponding antibodies. Uh, we get all the inflammatory markers titers. Uh, we get all the markers of disease activity, uh, baseline chemistry. So it's very important to use the same lab for monitoring. That's back to your question, which was addressed by the Quest or uh, lab corp or other labs. So you need to find the lab which gives you numeric numbers and then follow the numbers using the same lab. Uh, before uh, we even start process, typically, uh, typically, not necessarily always, but typically, uh, uh, we offer our patients some uh, preliminary things, which include heavy metal testing, because heavy metals can interfere with efficacy of anti antibiotics and antimicrobial uh, therapy. We recommend strongly to eliminate immunogenic foods, uh, typically gluten, dairy products, soy, eggs, corn, etc and reduce carb consumption to basically minimize the risk of fungal infections. And uh, typically uh, what we do in our practice, we're checking thyroid function, renal function, and uh, intestinal permeability to tune up all these things before we start the protocol. So ideally, ideally, you need to prepare gastrointestinal tract before you start antimicrobial therapy, and, and there's a room for probiotics and prebiotics and enzymes and motility enhancers and immune enhancers such as colostrum and manan oligosaccharide and so on and so on. So uh, we're using heavily intestinal permeability normalizers, mainly butyrates, and also uh, sometimes you need to use uh, glucuronidase inhibitors to prevent recycling of microbial toxins. So the typical one is uh, calcium glucuronate, but you can use uh, glucuronolactone as well. So, and then uh, there's a time for antibiotic therapy, which is a part of induction therapy. So, and you have multiple choices. Again, I don't want to be very specific, but you need to make a decision of what's the best for patient. So, uh, you can use synthetic antibiotics or herbal antibiotics, and sometimes herbal antibiotics work even better than synthetic. So, uh, you can use antibiotic combinations, 
you can use herbal combinations, you can use antibiotics and herbs if you know how to combine these things. So again, uh, you need to make a decision whether you want to target uh, your microorganism with a single or multiple antibiotics. And then you need to make a decision whether what's the most appropriate route of administration. So it may be oral, it may be intravenous, it may be intramuscular. In case of uh, strep, we're using bicillin, which is a long-acting penicillin. It may be inhaled in patients who have mycoplasma pneumonia and chlamydia pneumonia. We've been using more and more inhaled antibiotics uh, with great efficacy. So uh, you need to come up with a plan of uh, frequency of antibiotic rotations, and you need to define what's the projected duration of antibiotic therapy. So uh, this is the least not complete, but at least you know probably most commonly used things in our practice. Uh, so these are natural remedies with a strong antibiotic activity. So it's uh, olive leaf extract, uh, artemisinin, which is now available in pure form in the United sta States, cardiacetic acid, uh, extract from Smilex, anantamol, neem, catsclo, iparuru, and turmeric, berberine, bromelain, colloidal silver. Again, this list can be continued and continued, but in our cleaning, these are the most popular products. So I can list a couple of combinations because not too many people know uh, that you can combine very efficiently antibiotics and herbs and get uh, synergistic effects. All this has been published. You just need to look for this stuff. Like it's been shown that uh, fluoroquinolones are extremely synergistic with curcumin. And sometimes we combine fluoroquinolones with uh, IV curcumin, which can be obtained from Park Pharmacy, because again, curcumin in general is poorly absorbable. So beta-lactams also demonstrate extremely strong synergistic effect with curcumin. Uh, bromelain, which is a, a proteolytic enzyme from uh, pineapple, is strongly synergistic with tetracyclines. Uh, triazole antifungals, such as fluconazole or itraconazole, are very, very synergistic with berberine, and actually uh, there are probably like 25, 30 publications describing the mechanism of that. So then beta-lactams are very synergistic with colloidal silver. Again, all this stuff was published. So macrolides uh, also very synergistic with colloidal silver. Uh, macrolides are extremely synergistic with artemisinin, extremely synergistic. So we're using this combination more and more. Uh, so antimalarial antibiotics also synergistic with artemisinin. And it sounds like an irony because artemisinin by definition is antimalarial product as well. But in our area, specifically in rheumatology, we kind of used to combine various antimalarials uh, for uh, synergistic benefits. And again, this is something which we're using a lot. And then finally, you can combine serapeptase uh, and beta-lactams. Again, uh, this list can be continued and continued. I've showed uh, very frequent combos which we're using in our practice. So uh, when you're dealing with antibiotics, you have to be prepared to deal with uh, Herxheimer reaction or uh, die-off effect. It's almost unavoidable. Uh, almost all patients who have chronic infections, they develop various degrees of subacute septic shock, no matter whether you put these patients on IV, I, IM, uh, or oral antibiotics. Even if you start with low doses, there's some degree of curved time reaction, again, can manifest in different ways. So what's uh, the premise of this? So uh, first of all, administration of the antibiotics cause massive release of microbial toxin and uh, subsequent uh, hyperproduction of pro-inflammatory cytokines, histamine release, which is due to activation of mast cells, and a transient lactic acidosis and hypertension. Again, uh, the extent or degree of this reaction can vary from patient to patient, but it's almost unavoidable. And you have to explain to your patient that you're gonna deal with that. It may last a few days, it may last weeks, but that's part of the game. So uh, uh, this is the list of actually extreme manifestation of Herxheimer reaction. It's extreme fatigue, fever, myalgia and arthralgia, nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, headaches, hypertension, dizziness. Again, these are extreme things. We don't see them very often, but like, for example, some drop in the blood pressure, some nausea, we see it quite frequently. So how do we deal with that? So if patients uh, are not extremely symptomatic, so we typically put them on uh, fluids and we try to adjust the antibiotic dose, uh, however, in cases of very symptomatic patients, we can use high dose of thiamine. It works extremely well. Oral benfotiamine, uh, which uh, is a Japanese version of thiamine, it's a, a modification of thiamine which is extremely absorbable, can be used. Uh, succinic acid, it's a unique product which can be used uh, to deal with Herxheimer reaction. Why? 
So uh, if you look at European data, specifically Russian uh, studies from 80s and 90s, it's been shown that uh, succinic acid can decrease activation of macrophages uh, upon exposure of lipopolysaccharides. And so we found that oral succinic acid is extremely efficient. In extreme cases, we're using oral steroids and it's kind of last resort, it works almost universally. <coughs> Somehow among practitioners there is a fear of using steroids, which I don't have, and again, in patients with extreme Kirchheimer, that's the way to go. So, and again, I just put a couple of slides about, you know, detox enzyme system, so you're probably well aware about phase one and phase two, so I'm not going to go uh, through all these details, I just show it for uh, educational purposes. And uh, so how we can... Uh, facilitate a body tech system. So we're using various supplements. So like taurine is our mainstream, NAC or uh, an acetylcysteine plus glothathione, curcumin and silymarine, which is extract from milk thistle, uh, TMG, which is a key methylation agent. Uh, modified citrus pectin is becoming more and more popular in our practice. So you can buy it online under the brand name of uh, Pectasol. So it, it's uh, the only brand uh, which is highly absorbable and it binds uh, not only microbial toxins but heavy metals and move them uh, through kidneys and through intestine, very, very efficient. And then high doses of uh, B1, alpha-lipoic acid and B12, calcium glucarate uh, we're using to stop recycling of microbial toxins, uh, trifalo, trifalo, depending on your pronunciation, is a major motility agent which we're using a lot to move microbial toxins out. Uh, you can also, in some cases, use absorbents like psyllium, apple pectin, and so on and so on. I'm not a big proponent of absorbents because they also absorb antibiotics, and they bring the efficient concentration of antibiotics down quite a bit. And low-dose glucocorticoids can be used very efficiently. And again, there are some physical measures which you can use, which is infrared sauna, colonics, lymphatic drainage, and so on and so on. So uh, the maintenance phase, so let's say you're very successful in inducing of remission. So your patients are minimally symptomatic, uh, your patients uh, have no any markers of activity, and uh, so they want to get off antibiotics. Is it feasible? Absolutely. But you need to explain to your patients that if they stop antibiotics and don't do any maintain maintenance, so most likely they'll flare up within feasible future. So uh, what's the goal of maintenance? Well, uh, the goal of maintenance, number one, is to uh, kind of stimulate, maybe overstimulate immune system to create an environment where your immune system can control uh, the strong pool of microorganisms. And so typically, typically, I explain to my patient that it's a therapy which they need to kind of bite the bullet for and uh, probably expect to stay on for at least five years. And so uh, during this period of time, we monitor antibody activity, antibody levels, markers of disease activity, and typically we do it every four or six months. So what do we use? Well, we use a lot of uh, herbal antibiotics during that phase, and we use, we call them immune modifiers, colostrum, oral bovine immunoglobulins, curcumin, prebiotics, heavy, heavy prebiotics, and probiotics. So, uh, again, specifically because I'm a rheumatologist, uh, we'll talk about DMARDs, uh, which are disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, which are part of uh, protocols which we're using all the time in our practice. So, and we'll talk about uh, DMARDs as uh, antibiotics. So, not too many people know that most of the DMARDs can be used very efficiently against specific microorganisms, like uh, plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine can be used not only as uh, anti-malarial agent, but it also amplifies the attack of macrolides and tetracycline against intracellular pathogens such as, for example, mycoplasma pneumonia and chlamydia pneumonia and Bartonella. So uh, typically when we're dealing with patients who present with these infections, we introduce a combination of hydroxychloroquine and uh, one of the macrolides or tetracycline. Uh, metrixate, uh, surprisingly metrixate, not only anti-metabolic act, agent, it not only uh, suppress folic acid production in mammalian cells, but it also express strong activity against strep. And so uh, in cases of resistant, for example, rheumatic fever, panda syndrome, you can use metrixate with great efficacy. 
And metoxate works not only against uh, normal microbial forms, but it works also against L forms. So when you're dealing with resistant L forms, you can use metoxate or decayed L forms. Uh, sulfur salzine is our good friend because uh, it expresses broad activity against gram-negative microorganisms and it's a mainstream disease modifying drug. So leflunamide, also known as Areva, so uh, it's a basically a drug which inhibits uh, pyrimidine synthesis. But it also expresses strong activity against polyomaviruses and there is a subset of patients with lupus nephritis who have persistent polyomaviruses, so leflunamide would be highly indicated in these cases. So calcicin, uh, again, uh, it's an old remedy for gout, but calcicin has very strong antifungal activity, probably comparable to uh, fluconazole or itraconazole, and you can combine it with various drugs to amplify that activity. And then, you know, surprisingly, you know, there are some kind of classical immunosuppressants like imiran or azathioprine or 5 aminosalicylic acid. Uh, these drugs, uh, they express very strong antimicrobial activity against atypical mycobacteria. So keep it in mind that, again, you can use disease-modifying drugs alone or in combination with antibiotics uh, to gain the desirable effects. So, and again, uh, very similar uh, to uh, antibiotics, there are synergistic combinations. So you can use uh, hydroxychloroquine and macrolides, hydroxychloroquine and tetracycline, sulfasalazine and tetracyclines, aminocycline in particular, sulfasalazine and macrolides, leflunamide and fluoroquinolones, extremely efficient combination. And again, uh, right now, for patients who have atypical mycobacteria, this is probably the protocol of choice. It's azathioprine or imiran combined with macrolides and rifampin. And again, you can find tons of publication about how synergistic this combination is. Uh, so, uh, and again, because of our area, so we're using more aggressive therapy. So when? So what's the reason? So, well, first of all, uh, when we're dealing with catastrophic illnesses, so, for example, we have patients with necrotizing vasculitis. I don't have time to mess up with antibiotics because this patient is going to die within a couple of months. So we need to use much, much heavier drugs. Catastrophic antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, lupus, scleroderma, renal crisis, so on and so on. So there is a place for everything. So there is a place for herbs, there is a place for antibiotics, there is a place for disease-modifying drugs, and there is a place for immunosuppressants and biologics. So uh, when we're dealing with rapidly progressive illness, which potentially can create major anatomical damage. So we're using heavy drugs, like psoriatic arthritis with osteolysis, so-called arthritis mutualness. If you're not aggressive enough, patients losing their fingers and toes. You don't have time to mess up with anything else. But once you stabilize this patient, you can do other things. Patients with active sacroiliitis, active spinal intersitis, uh, causing fusion of the spinal and fusion of sacroiliac joints, you need to be very aggressive because otherwise you lose the window of opportunity and these patients will be handicapped for the rest of their life. Uh, so, uh, there are obviously diseases where uh, the symptoms are not controlled by antimicrobial and antiviral therapy alone. So there is a time for more heavy therapy. And also, uh, we're talking about diseases which present to your practice at late stages. So you have diseases where patients have established clones of B cells, and these clones proliferate independent from antigenic stimuli. You have patients who have invasive synovial fibroblasts, and so you need to be very aggressive because uh, Again, in this situation, patients are at risk of losing their function, at risk of losing, uh, actually, uh, integrity of the organs and joints. So you need to be much more aggressive and don't waste your time with, so with anything else. So uh, you can stabilize this patient with immunosuppressants and biologics and then do antimicrobial uh, and all, all these things down the road. So, questions? Can we thank Dr. Shipman for his interview? Well, the question is, what are you going to culture? And so, well, that's the main issue. If I would know what to culture, I would do it, right? So, but you cannot biopsy every single organ in the body. It's not practical. So if you want to do the PCR, what are you going to PCR on? If you have an obvious tissue to PCR, yes, you can do it. But if you don't, it's a practicality. That's obvious, thank you. And do you have, what are your, your cutoffs when you're getting your um, quantitative results in terms of antibodies and your time of the 
uh, it's a highly individual depending on the infection you're dealing with. So there are different cutoffs for different infections. You don't have a, like five-fold, ten-fold increase? Or that, that's for sure, most likely. So typically it's a 3x. 3x. Typically, although it may vary from infection to infection. Great, thank you. And lastly, you And again, it depends on the lab. It depends on the lab which you're using. And again, sometimes you don't get any quantitative results. You get like yes, no. Like in case of Lyme disease, you get bands, right? So you need to come up with your own criteria, what you consider is positive and what you consider is negative. And so deal with that. And then lastly, do you, do you uh, speak of the mechanism of action one, high dose B1, low dose B1, uh, it's a good question. So uh, basically, uh, there's a mechanism linked to uh, uh, lipopolysaccharides reacting with toll receptors. And there's a whole kind of uh, chain of events resulting in activation of macrophages through uh, toll receptors. So there's some data showing that high dose of B1 prevent activation of toll receptors. That's all I can tell you. It's been shown, actually. Thank you for those questions. In the middle of the room, we have our next question. Dr. Schiffman, I'm curious, um, you know, just to, to find, uh, Banksin Alpha 1, you didn't mention it, to strengthen the no, system. No, I don't have much experience with it. No. Okay. It has really, I, I haven't really reinforced it from the other I don't have any experience with it. Thank you. Thank you. Looking for the next hand. Advalence efficiency? Yeah. Uh, we're kind of uh, trying to simplify our approach. So we're using uh, basically LabCorp for that. So we're testing hormones at 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. twice the same day. So uh, typically what we do, we check cortisol level, uh, we check DHEA, DHEA sulfate, uh, aldosterone, and pregnenolone at a.m. And we check cortisol at 5 p.m. And so based on the numbers, we create kind of picture what to expect. So in, in some situations, we're using cartosine stimulation test. If I, I'm not positive that I know exactly what's going on, but that's kind of our approach. We don't rely heavily on saliva because I found that it's not very reliable. That serum? Serum, yes, serum, yes. Thank you for that question. Rice of the room towards the back. Thank you. Um, for the antibiotic therapy, are experiencing adverse similar reactions, and especially the more serious, so the nausea, the vomiting, and that type of thing. And they've already gone through kind of that seven or ten day program of antibiotics. How long do you continue uh, to dose that antibiotic? Well, it depends on it depends on the symptoms. So if the symptoms are unbearable, so typically we'll either switch the antibiotics or lower the dose. Okay. So and if they're not unbearable, for the a couple of weeks max. Okay. So Two or three weeks, yes. Okay, so basically a double or triple type of therapy. Right. Okay, and then the second one is um, for uh, an RA patient that might be on some of these biological drugs um, that also has some of the infections yes. that you're talking about that some of these drugs treat, um, what do you do with it then? Because they're on a drug that looks like it should be treating that kind of organism, but it's not. So uh, again, uh, it's a very good question and it's a very complicated one because uh, sometimes in real life when you miss that window of opportunity, so you have patients who have established clones of B cells, you have patients who have a very aggressive uh, synovial fibroblasts, so, and again, you can use, you can utilize antibiotics, but again, typically it's not enough, typically. So it's based on your judgment. So, but at the same time, you can use uh, drugs like DMARDs or antibiotics, uh, which have kind of double mechanism of action. So for example, Plaquenil is our friend because it has so many different applications. So we didn't talk about that, but for example, minocycline, right? So it's a traditional tetracycline antibiotics, but minocycline also blocks CRX receptor. And so you can get very significant anti-inflammatory effect with minocycline when you use it. And if you combine minocycline and plaquenil, you have doubled up, you can kind of, you double the efficacy of this combination. So there are different things. It depends on the uh, kind of individual patient. So, but I can tell you that if you have a patient at early stages of RA, so majority of this patient can be treated very aggressively with antibiotics or with great success. Thank you for those questions. The 
this was always the active side of the room. <laughs> you must, you must, yeah. Do you treat JIA? Uh, we do, but uh, our clinic typically focuses on adults. We do have some patients with JRA, but it depends on the age. Because I see some children, one, two, three year old. No, uh, no, because uh, we're not equipped. Well, we, we have different modalities. Uh, so our modalities typically focus on, a, let's say, if teenagers are perfectly fine, but not one and three year old. No. Uh, sorry. Thank you. Staying on this side of the room. Uh, as you said, uh, high dose thiamine IV and uh, phosphophenphotiamine and acid acid. What kind of doses are? Uh, well, for thiamine, you're talking about uh, you're dealing with three, four hundred milligrams IV. Uh, Benfotiamine, you can go if it's an oral one, you can go easily to six, seven hundred milligram. Uh, succinic acid, you can go up to a gram, depends on how much patient will tolerate, uh, because typically it's an acid. So they can start having problems with acidity. Gerald is a problem. But you can push it up. Thank you. Our next question is staying on this side. Uh, in your uh, presentation, you mostly uh, show that the bacterial infection, and you see the, the increase of the uh, white blood cell. Do you see some latent infection have a Depressed, uh, yeah, yeah it, it depends on depends on the infection. So what I showed, it's kind of a typical, but again, it's not hundred percent obvious. Yes. Thank you. And the, 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 the. We do use, we, okay. we do use, I just, you know, because of the time limitation, I didn't go through all these things yet, but absolutely. You know, it's a separate topic because uh, in real life, quite frequently you're dealing with polymicrobial situations where you have not one, but multiple microorganisms. You have situation when you have a viral load with like EBV, CMV, and a couple of uh, microbial infections. It's a completely separate topic, so I couldn't cover everything today. But yes, we, we do use antivirals, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, yes, so, uh, well, basically, you need to establish uh, the baseline for activity, right? And so, how do you establish baseline? So, if you look at the publication, what's the most reliable marker? So uh, typically, these are antibodies against early antigen, right? So you establish your kind of baseline, and then uh, you make a decision whether you want to use uh, antivirals or whether you want to use uh, uh, basically herbs. So if you look at, uh, and again, there are different protocols. So I'll tell you what's the most efficient. So the most efficient protocol for uh, antivirals is valcite or valgancyclovir. So, uh, and tell your patient that they'll probably spend between six, 12 months on Valcite. So it doesn't happen overnight. So uh, there's uh, probably around 15, 20 publications about using Valcite for patients with chronic fatigue. And it makes a huge difference after six months. So you don't see any early uh, changes. So it's a very well tolerated therapy. So uh, if you look at uh, uh, alternative world, so what is uh, the most efficient uh, in uh, non-prescription world, so it's artemisinin uh, combined with uh, cordyceps. So we have tons of articles proving that uh, that's a very efficient combination. And then uh, lately we start using uh, high dose inosine and PABA, P-A-B-A. So that's our new protocol. So it's uh, four drugs, four, I'm sorry, four supplements. So it's uh, artemisinin, uh, it's uh, cordyceps, inosine, and paraminobenzoic acid, PABA. Thank you for that question. Over on the left side. Hmm? The right side of the room wants to give the left signal condition. We're getting some questions coming here. Just one of the last question. two of the four lists. Uh, Inosine and PABA. P A B A. Parminobenzoic acid. Can I ask you why I have the PABA here? Can we uh, yes. Can we get the mic there in a second? Is that a question? Or yeah. Can, just go with me. So the question is, uh, why do we use uh, PABA in patients with EBV? 
So PABA is one of the uh, PABA is the strong one of the strongest natural inducers of gamma interferon. Okay, next question. With the nuclear question, what is the quantitative for like say a team bar, which is a nuclear range? Uh, they max out around five. No, uh, we, we don't use Quest WBV, it just, it's not worth it. I understand you like the quantitative quest uh, results, right? Uh, we don't use, we use LabCorp uh, early for EBV, yes, yeah, specifically for EBV, it's early antigen, the uh, results are very, very reproducible, you know, we don't have any problems with LabCorp. Okay. Do they do uh, quantitative? Yes, they do. The LabCorp do quantitative for that? Yes, one? yes. Uh, and, and, and another another thing, like the kind of. No, we, we don't treat. Well, you have a patient with a very high number of particles, viral particles, but they're not activated. Okay. So one thing which I didn't mention. So uh, there are some other criteria which you don't see very frequently in your practice, but once in a while, maybe we see a couple of patients a year. So if patients have IgM antibodies against uh, uh, VCA, which is viral capsid antigen or nuclear antigen, it's considered as part of uh, activation. So if you do have IgM antibodies, it's a must to treat them. Thank you. We have another question over on the right side. Can you speak a little bit more about what your approach is when you have the polymethylene region? It's complicated. So it's a separate topic. <laughs> Next question. What are some of your methods for testing the intracellular microorganisms? Uh, serology. Serology? Yes. And actually, you can follow serology very nicely. You can see the drop in, let's say, you have a person with mycoplasma pneumonia infection, right? So you start reading that person, so you can follow the numbers. They drop down very nicely. Lunch is ready, but. We can take another few questions if you feel the urge. We have invited Dr. Shipman to join us for a panel discussion this afternoon, so uh, perhaps you 